Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jacques Delisle, the director of the Asia Program here at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Uh, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. If you're in our time zone this morning or this evening, perhaps if you're in some other time zones, uh, and it's a terrific uh, pleasure for me to welcome to this uh, week's session uh, Nan Jia, who's an associate professor of management and organization at the USC Marshall School of Business. Uh, today's session is part of our China Center series on China and geoeconomic issues, China, the U.S., and technology issues. Uh, and that program, like all of our programs, are supported by our Board of Trustees, our supporters, and with this particular slice of our programming, especially Jim Avril with his generous donation. These programs are, of course, free to, free to you, but they're not free to us. So if you'd uh, care to join or support FBRI, you're more than welcome and indeed uh, very much requested to do so. You can find information uh, in the chat that will um, uh, do that, or, or you can just go to our webpage. A couple of uh, housekeeping measures. A lot of you I know are, are regulars here, but uh, for those of you who aren't, uh, and even for those of you who are, a reminder uh, that the way we'll work this is that we'll begin with uh, the first half or a little bit less of our session uh, being a presentation, in this case a presentation uh, by Professor Jia, um, rather than a dialogue between me and her, and then we will move on to um, Q&A. For the question and answer period, we encourage you to put in your questions as the talk goes along. Please use the Q&A function uh, rather than the chat function uh, so that we'll be easily able to find your questions and I will pose them uh, as we get into the Q&A portion. Uh, excuse me if I can't get to everybody or if I wind up combining some questions. That's you know, the nature of having a one hour slot. So since it is only a one hour slot, uh, let me uh, not waste more time on introductions uh, except to uh, welcome Professor Jia, who again is an Associate Professor of Management and Organization at USC Marshall School of Business. Uh, her work has appeared in many of the leading journals in the field, including China Quarterly, the Journal of Politics, Administrative Science Quarterly, and all the leading management journals. And she's here to talk to us today about Clash of the Titans with a question mark, uh, development of artificial intelligence technologies in the U.S. and China. Uh, so I've heard a version of this talk before, and I can assure you you're in for a really interesting session. Without further ado, Professor Jia. Thank you so much, Jax. Um, thanks so much for, the, for, for inviting me and for the kind introduction. So let me share my screen. Um, so the plan here is for me to kick off the discussion with all of you with a uh, 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 20 minutes, or less than 20 minutes of uh, introduction of what we have we have done so far, which is still this line of research is still ongoing, but I'd like to share with you what we found so far and hopefully that will trigger some, some questions. Um, and uh, so let me, uh, in the, my next slide, um, I'm not going to have any word about China or US or AI, but it's, it's a little bit more fundamentally about why uh, uh, I am interested in this, and but I think it's also a fundamental issue that lies behind a lot of industry policies, um, which is this debate about what the role is the state can play in fostering innovation. Um, so essentially, right now, there are two camps at this moment. One can say, you know, if you're familiar with the helping hand model, um, that the state has proven to be highly successful in propping up a lot of the manufacturing sectors that's proven to be true in the East Asian countries and many other parts of the world. So following that model, it probably is the case that state can also start to foster innovation as well as they did to the, to the manufacturing sector. So there's a bunch of literature said that yes, state-led innovation or state-led but uh, industry policies for innovation is going to prevail. On the other hand, there's a lot of a lot of skepticism, skepticism like um, my, and, and myself included here. So there's a lot of because doing innovation is fundamentally from manufacturing sector sectors. Uh, for example, it's very difficult for you to have a benchmark. Uh, before iPhone was invented, it's very difficult for us to go to tell our subordinates, go out and create iPhone. You don't know what, what, what could have been the, um, invented. So that raises a question of incentives. And from there, it raises the question of whether this, the state actually um, is the in the best position to get the incentives, incentives right. So, um, um, uh, so I want to pose this bigger question there for you, and I personally think that um, the domain of artificial intelligence is a highly salient um, place to look at technology development and also in particular state's ambition in fostering these technologies. Um, so you've, you've probably heard of this a lot, that the AI is poised to transform all sorts of things in our lives, social, economic, economic military, so on and so forth. And in the news, it's also uh, all over the news, um, um, uh, it's, it's focused on this, 
competition between China and the, and the U.S., which are indeed the two big elephants in the room when it comes to AI, AI technology development. Um, so there's a debate about uh, are they are they are they competing? Are they collaborating? Who is winning? Who is losing? Those are the those are those are I know the questions that draws a lot of attention. Um, and what I'm trying to, to, to show you today, I don't have an answer to those questions. I want to show you the steps that we take to hopefully enable us to, to shed more light on, on, the, on those questions. But before we go in there, I think it's important to, to understand what are we talking about? What is this thing called artificial intelligence? Um, so we need to identify them. You know, as a scholars, we need empirical evidence. And in order to get empirical evidence, first of all, we need to know where to find these AI uh, technologies, which is actually a non-trivial uh, trivial um, effort. Uh, for example, in this talk, we're focusing on patents. Patents are the largest depository of human knowledge, applied knowledge in particular. Um, but then in, the, um, in patents, although there is a patent class called AI, it actually is by no means captures all type of AI technologies. The reason is, this is something that it, I, I suspect will come up also later when we're chatting about um, uh, 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 the public policies. AI is a what scholars call general purpose technologies in that it can be used in developing a whole bunch of very different technologies. So as a result, a lot of AI technologies, they are filed at a, in a different patent classes. So in order to do that, um, my co-authors and I, we have to identify what AI technologies are in the US, in the US PTO patents, um, and then also among the SNPA patents, which are the domestic patent system in China. So we use machine learning methods to actually identify what these AI technologies are. So what's interesting, the next slide, I'm um, just give you a sense of what I, we are talking about. Uh, so the next slide shows you the most frequently uh, uh, used words that were used that, that, that actually identifies AI patterns based on our methods. If you look at what they are, um, none of them is called AI. They are patent recognition, they're machine learning, your, your neural networks, um, their image processing. So those are actually the, the areas or domains where AI technologies are being used for. What's interesting is that AI was not there. And is there is a um our explanation that's it's an easy way for social scientists, policymakers, you know, that the layman to describe the technologies, but that's not the terminology that people who actually develop technologies would, would, would use. They call their technologies what it is, whether it's a neural network or, a, or patent, patent detection. All right, so the, this is the, this is the, these are the technologies that we're talking about. Um, and I, uh, so next, I'd like to show you a few graphs to, uh, uh, to, to, share, to share with you who are doing this, who are developing AI technologies. And the particular patent dimension we're looking at are universities versus firms, um, for-profit firms. So here are two graphs. First of all, these are the AI patents seen developed in China and over time. Um, post 2006, you will see a clear diversion that universities all of a sudden overtook firms in producing, producing these AI patents. So what happens in 2006? A lot of things, in, among, among which is a major um, campaign, is a central government initiated campaign called uh, in the, it, that, that actually promotes indigenous innovation. Um, so it's not AI specific, but it's very much innovation uh, focused. Um, it is meant to be the legacy of the president at the time, with President Hu, who is all over the news these days. Um, and uh, so that's also the time when you start to see not just AI patterns, but patterns from China starts to all of a sudden took off and very quickly overtook a number of patterns in Japan and US. So 2006, that's the starting time of this policy. So what we see here in the AI domain is after this time, universities in, universities in China play a way more uh, significant role in doing this. Do we see the same thing happen in the US? Not really. So we have still have 2006, we have all the US PTO AI patches. You kind of see there's no clear divergence since that time. And in fact, in the US, if you look at the top assignees of of AI uh, patents, AI US PTO patents, they are mostly 
uh, they are mostly firms. Actually, all, the, all of them are actually firms here. If you go down the list a little bit, which you don't see as you see here, you'll get to see Stanford, Berkeley. Uh, those are academic institutions. And here we actually color coded foreign firms versus US firms. It's kind of interesting to see that for, there are a lot of Japanese firms um, here. Um, they are in imaging processing. So uh, that's another, that's a, a big area in which AI technologies are developed. So therefore, in the US, AI patents are predominantly developed by firms, for-profit firms. And this pattern, if you're looking in China, is very different. So here we color-coded firms versus universities. Although you do see uh, 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 firms, um, the common suspects are Huawei and ZTE, they are top. Mostly uh, the active patent, uh, entities that are producing AI patents in China, they are universities. And I highlight, well, the exercise here, well, apologies for those who have their own systems of, uh, of uh, rankings of Chinese universities. So there are some universities that are generally, uh, we regard it as a top tier, like Zhejiang and Tsinghua and Shanghai Jiao Tong University, they are there. But then there are also kind of, a, so there are also some other universities, for example, these three, they are the one of the servants that belong to the, to the, to the Chinese military. Um, and then in addition to them, there are also the universities where you typically do not see, see them higher in ranking. And all of a sudden, they are really active in the, in the production of AI patents. And so it's a very different picture of who is actually developing these technologies in China as opposed to the, to the US. So we want to probe further to see where are these universities? Where where AI patents are being produced in China? So this graph you see is is not just AI; it's just any patents in China across different provinces. Um, and not surprisingly, more patents across the board are produced in more de economic development regions and on, on the coastal on the coastlines and where a lot of firms are. Uh, I want to highlight Guangdong is not really high. Um, so, so that's something that we need to, uh, uh, it's, it's curious, we need to check in the data. If you look at AI patents, the number of AI patents, well, there are some of these uh, uh, economic developed regions like Beijing right here, they are also heavily producing AI patents. A lot of other provinces that were actually not so active in producing, um, uh, producing patents where innovation in general would stand out. This is uh, 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 so Shanxi, Sichuan, and um, and the Hubei provinces. So all of a sudden, they are leading in producing producing AI patents in particular. Um, so that's so. This is a kind of a curious. Uh, uh, those are especially in those inland provinces. That's not where a lot of economic activities take place. That's not a, where a lot of firms are actually using AI technologies are taking place. So the suspect here, you will wonder. There must be some. There might be some public policy influence um, going on there. Um, let me let me just very quickly show you. If I if you look at actually universities and firms across these uh, uh, these provinces, if you look at firms on my left hand side, well, your uh, left 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 hand side, um, it kind of uh, traces what you saw in the general in the uh, general patenting pattern. But it is on the right hand side. If you look at universities, AI patterns developed by universities across China, across all the locations, very much mirrors what the question we raised in the previous slide, which is that some of the less economically developed, more remote inland provinces, they are leading in AI technologies. So the question, so therefore, the conclusion here is it seems to be that most of the AI patterns in China are actually produced by universities, but not just any universities, but the universities located in those less economically developed inland places. And um, I wanted to just to give, just to show you, to further show you this, uh, um, this trend. Um, what we've done, what we've done here is a little bit ad hoc. We took Shanxi, Sichuan, Gui, which the three places that, that, that I, I, I highlighted in my previous, in my previous slide. We, we took them out and compared them with Everybody else minus those hubs, you know, Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangdong. They are, they are extreme. They, they could be outliers. We exclude them. And we do that for firms and the universities, universities. So indeed, the takeaway of this slide is that it is the firms, I'm sorry, it is the universities that are located 
in particularly Shaanxi, Sichuan, the Hubei, those kind of inland provinces that are leading the AI patent production um, uh, in China. Um, so, so as as I previously mentioned, there's a there's a suspicion that must be some sort of public policy uh, guidance um, uh, taking place here, um, and there are there are indeed some. Uh, uh, it's, so, uh, a popular press such as Economist or would have some articles to to actually confirm this this intuition um, that these kind of the re these are the regions where policies are most active in pro in producing AI patents. So the question is, okay, there is a all right, patents are AI patents are produced by different entities in different places. So what? What does it mean for the for the let's say the technologies in general? So I want to uh, uh, take the, the, um, the, the, this into a direction of where is the frontier? Who are in the U.S. and in China? Who are actually at the frontier? It's not the ones that are producing most AI technologies. It's the ones that are actually producing the no, most novel, the leading AI technologies. Um, so in the U.S., we see a shift. The shift is this. In the non-AI domain, typically universities, they are producing frontier technologies because they have the resources, they have the incentive to be novel. And for firms, you know, they have different type of incentives. Um, they typically, they are focused on exploitation rather than exploration. So uh, this is, uh, this is, uh, uh, this is pretty much like a established insights that universities typically, uh, typically lead the frontier of general innovation. For AI innovation, we actually see a reversal. The reversal is because the key to AI, AI technologies are data. And in the US, data are mostly owned by firms. They came from their user data. And because of data pr protection or privacy and, and many regulations, um, firms are, the universities actually do not have the same access to the data. So the shift of the frontier AI technologies moved from universities to firms. Therefore, firms are leading AI, frontier AI technologies in the US. I just want to very quickly show you that if you trust me, like if I'm, I'm asking for a leap of faith here, that my dependent variable measures uh, the novelty or the frontier or the quality of these AI technologies. And for AI technologies, which is so for non AI technologies, the traditional one, which is indicated by the solid, solid line, universities they achieve much higher uh, 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 novelty. Uh, however, this gap narrow compared with firms, but this gap narrows for AI technologies, which is indicated by this dash line. So in the US, so in the US, AI techno the novel AI, tech AI technologies are produced by firms. Um, but what about China? So re re just recall that in China, uh, a lot of data, so we said the data in the US are mostly owned by firms. In China, a lot of data owned by the government um, through mass from mass surveillance. So, is it the case that these universities that are publicly owned, they have better access to data, so they can produce better um, or higher quality or more novel AI technologies? Uh, our data says no. Um, so, the pattern of uh, AI, the novelty or novel AI technology production in China, very much traces that in the US. In China, we we'll also see that firms are leading um, the frontier AI technology development. And very quickly recall that, is, but the firms are not the most active in producing AI technologies. So what this, this data shows us so far is that Chinese universities, they, are, they churn out the most patents, AI patents, but then they are not really producing the most novel AI patents. Um, that's what we have so far. So if that's the, if not the access to data, then it must be some sort of a public policy influence, right? It's, it's, it's because the, the, the government wants, says, we want this kind of uh, AI technology being developed. Therefore, uh, universities, you go uh, go there to do, to do that. There may or may not be a real economic need for this or, or uh, economic demand to company, but then there's a policy mandate. So that is definitely possible. And that's also uh, something that we are in the process of trying to, 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 look, to, to look at. So yeah, this is something that with academic research, 
we have some speculations, but we cannot actually write a paper based on speculations. We need to pre present with the data. So we're, what we're trying to do is that at this moment, we're trying to find some de jure and antecedents, which are policies like public policy documents. We're also trying to find some de facto incentives that might drive a region to or entities in the regions to be more actively develop AI technologies. Um, those are say the region of polit polit uh, politicians uh, on career incentives, for example. Um, and then there's a consequence of what does it mean uh, for uh, sort of even further divergence into the type of technologies that being produced if in, uh, they are, the entities that are actually producing them have different incentives and they follow, they uh, and, and they have different goals to achieve. So Jax, I'm gonna pause here. And uh, I think this is a great time for us to maybe uh, take some questions and start a conversation. Well, great, uh, thanks so much. And again, I want to encourage people to uh, put questions or comments in the Q&A uh, box. So I'll just start off with a couple while people are thinking of that. We do have some questions already that I'll weave in as well. Um, so one way it seems of, of reading what you're saying is almost as, um, affirming the indictment one often hears of industrial policy, right? Mm -hmm. That is, if the state invests resources or creates incentives uh, for actors who are not you know, fully directly subordinate to the state to go out and do things, mm -hmm. uh, you'll get a lot of activity, but mm -hmm. you may not get cutting edge activity. So uh, you're telling a story where basically the universities are turning out a lot of AI, but it's not necessarily the best AI that's coming from those who are, who are not getting those kinds of, of incentives. Is that fair? Um, so um, let me let me go back to sharing my screen because I think that's gonna uh, that's gonna help. Let me let me just do that. Um, I, that I would say uh, would be my suspicion uh, and my speculation. Um, and that's something that we are we need to establish evidence for. So I want to show you this slide because this one particular paper, uh, this is my paper. Um, so this is not AI specific, but we did show that after a 2006 you know, national policy, sorry, national campaign to promote indigenous policies, um, Chinese state-owned enterprises, SOEs, those who suffer a lot from agency risks are the fastest to churn out the largest number of patents, but then they are they lag behind there, and then their proportion of novel patents declined. So there's a game being played when you're sent at the policy mandates and your subordinate are there to execute them. So the, the the fundamental issue here is is that it's much easier to quantify your innovation outcome. It's so much more difficult to assess what is being develop and what is novel and what is useful. So it goes back to the question, the, the issue of uh, this is not just a China where US specific, where AI specific, where no innovation specific. It's just very difficult to get incentives right. Um, and so uh, so indeed, Jax, to, to your question, um, when there's a policy mandate, Obviously, there's a lot of strings that can be attached to these universities that are public fund publicly funded. Um, but at the same time, it depends on how they're being evaluated. So most likely, the policymakers, they're going to look at, oh, these are not one, two, three, four, five patents and six uh, publications and maybe weighted by <laughs> the impact score of these journals. And that that's about it. Um, it's very difficult to go in there to see, are you doing something that is actually needed? Or are you doing something that is, uh, is, is did you actually manage to push the front, the production frontier um, the, or the frontier of the technologies? Then that's very difficult to assess. Right. So, yeah, so getting getting a reliable uh, data on what sort of getting the right screen for 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 what's truly innovative, as you point out, tough. Uh, so this raises a host of interesting sort of contextual questions uh, about this kind of policy in general. And, and one is, you know, there's a story about China's rapid economic development, which started yeah. out, of course, very low tech and has moved increasingly yeah. to higher tech sectors. But there's sort of the old, um, for the academic nerds out there in the audience, the Alexander Gershenkron theory, right? The advantages of backwardness. So when you see the road ahead, mm -hmm. uh, industrial policy can work pretty well. You know, go manufacture this more efficiently, go yeah. copy this technology, adapt it, innovate around the edges. But the conventional wisdom has been that gets much harder to do as you become a cutting edge, you know, developing um, yeah. the frontier stuff, which which AI definitely is. Uh, does your data give you any leverage on that question? 
Um, I, I think so. So that actually is one of the main drivers why I am looking at, um, so a stream of my research focus, focus on this. Um, so I think there's a, uh, so there's, so you mentioned this distinction of when you are have a low, lower hanging fruit that you're low, lower level technologies and then are cutting edge. And I think there's also quite a bit of difference between well, well, the, the first and second industri industrial uh, uh, revolution as we know it, mostly about manufacturing as opposed to the third and some some people call it the fourth uh, that pertains to knowledge production. So in industrial manufacturing, what you have is indeed there's a package of technologies. You know what you're you, what you're being you, what we're trying to uh, implement, what to adopt, and there's clear benchmarking. So Jax, you're running this side of a factory, this side of the factory using this technology. I know others how well others can do with this. So they produce this this many of outputs within a certain period of time with using this much uh, of a capital, and that's your benchmark. And if you fail with that benchmark, I'm going to look into it. So it's very easy to do the benchmarking. So there, so therefore, the information there is a lot less information asymmetry, and this is this kind of uh, features are absent when we're talking about someone is out there to produce knowledge or produce innovation. So number one is that there's a lot more uncertainties about what's going on. Um, so you, we no longer have a very established playbook um, as we do in the manufacturing. A package manufacturing technologies as opposed to um as opposed to you know what could have been produced in knowledge we do not often times we do not know ahead of time and but number two benchmarking becomes a lot more difficult right and because it's no it's it's uh it does not exist if you're talking about innovation um oftentimes their benchmarks do not exist in this world right where we're trying to push the frontier of human knowledge so when that happens it's much difficult for a supervising entity such as a state to use command um, to say you do this and I'm going to monitor you and I'm going to punish you if you don't if you do not achieve it and I'm going to reward you if you do achieve it. So this type of tool worked well in the in, in manufacturing sector. It met it met meets a lot of challenges uh, when we're talking about knowledge uh, knowledge production. So a lot of the common um, I've definitely seen a lot of debates about the state led state led uh, public uh, uh, industrial policy. Um, a lot of advantage we have seen, let's say, uh, of that the exhibit in China, in the, especially in the past forty years, uh, were enabled by these features of producing manufacturing firms. And so there is a big question mark of whether the way command works can actually can actually effectively produce innovation or. It might produce innovation, but at, at, but with a huge amount of waste because of these games played by economic agents in responding to uh, to, to the command. Um, and so let me just want to say one more thing. I know we might have a couple of more questions, um, which is that what's interesting is that uh, uh, if you look at uh, China's current uh, policies about innovation, it's still trying to benchmark. So what it's bench trying to benchmark on is the U.S. Yeah, at the same time, in the U.S., when you look at the uh, discussions about industrial policies, is some of the discussion trying to benchmark on China. So it's kind of a weird thing to say that we need to think about whether the move and try to improve industrial policy in the in the past era might can still be used here, and that's a, a question mark before you start benchmarking on, on, on one another. Right. And then we are in this moment where the U.S. is talking more about doing industrial policy than it usually does. Yeah. There's a big question about whether the U.S. does industrial policy or can, but, but things like the CHIPS Act and various other incentives are, are certainly trying to do that. And, and there is a certain, uh, a certain irony that, that that discussion is going on at the very moment that we're continuing the critique of the flaws as American critics see it in the Chinese economy of too much industrial policy, too much state-led, and now we're, we're essentially mirroring that uh, to, to some degree. Um, so uh, there's a question in, in the chat that, that takes us back to your earlier point about the difficulty of data, sort of figuring out what the proxy is for getting at, I mean, you're really interested in innovation here. And of yeah. course, the question is how to measure that. And yeah. so the questioner says, um, you know, there's at, at some level, even though you've, you've done a lot of cleaning up on this, um, there is a, a kind of equivalence of patents and innovation. Um, you know, sort of what, how does one grapple with that? What other indications of innovation might be considered? Yeah. And you've done some of that, but if you could just sort of uh, elaborate a bit more. Definitely. 
Yeah, so that's a fantastic question because indeed uh, you see a lot of uh, uh, examination of, of, of patterns, uh, partly because indeed it is one of the largest depositories of human knowledge, but that's also part of because it's also easier to obtain. <laughs> it's public, it's out there. Um, so commonly, so here, here this, this may not be a comprehensive list of places to look, but I think they are, they probably together, they probably account for the majority of the knowledge that, that, that matter to us. Um, Pat is definitely one of them. They have, they mostly, uh, uh, uh they captures, uh, uh, applied knowledge and academic publication. That's another, uh, type of, uh, uh, sources to capture, uh, innovate, innovation, innovative knowledge. They, no, normally, they pertain more to the basic type of uh, knowledge, and academic publications are freely available, unlike patents. And in some of the more emerging technologies, such as AI and, and enabled AI's machine learning technology, you also have a lot of open source uh, technologies. So that's another type um, that was not captured by patents, that was not published, but then there is a huge, increasingly growing community of open source, um, open source innovations uh, that uh, actually uh, that matters uh, in many cases, matter critically to a development of knowledge. And traditionally, there's another type, which is uh, uh, some some knowledge are firm preserved as a secret, trade secret, um, are difficult to capture, but they are there. Uh, I'm not sure uh, how much they account for. The, the the knowledge that AI based uh, innovation or knowledge, um, but I have indeed seen um, uh, some work trying to look at. So our work trying we, we focus on patterns, but we also were working on uh, publications because the, the data is right there. Um, I have started to see some work that look at open source innovations just to identify who is leading and what is the conversation and how where the know how the knowledge flow occurs. Right. And that, of course, is one of the paradoxes of, of that particular category of intellectual property. And we're used to talking about uh, copyright, which oddly has been used for software, although it seems like in some ways should be more patented. Uh, then there's yeah. patents, which is at the core of what you're looking at. And then there are trade secrets, which are devilishly tough because there's no registration process the way there is for yeah. a patent. And because to have a trade secret remain intellectual property of the creator, you actually have to keep it secret. Yes. <laughs> so, so you may know it exists, but it's very hard to get the information you need to know how innovative it is because you know, yeah. you've got to take measures to keep it out. So it's a, it is a, an interesting artifact of the structure of intellectual property rights where the law is really quite standard around the world. I mean, China has adopted uh, basic IP laws that are pretty similar to what you find every place else. Partly they're anchored in the major intellectual property treaties and WIPO and, and things like that. So uh, some homogenization. Um, all right, so, so one, one question I want to push I know you don't have the data for this because this is forward looking, but yeah. uh, in some ways we're shooting at moving targets here, right? Yeah. And as you've got a snapshot of what was going on when the world was the way it was from the Hu Jintao era, Chuang Xin Jingji, innovative economy, up through the at least part of the Xi Jinping years, which may be with us for a while. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but but what about sort of contextual factors that might be shifting and what, what would you predict they would do to what you're looking at? So for instance, we've talked about the US now getting into the industrial policy game. Yeah with a big pile of money, some of which will go to firms, some of which will go to universities. Yeah. Um, but we've also got China in a moment where it looks like the state is become, or the party state is becoming a little more heavy handed uh, in its dealing with firms. Uh, so they may yeah. try to steer firms more. So maybe the firm university distinction uh, might be under some stress. And yeah. in the US, we're starting to see signs of a tech bust that is a possible loss of the financial resources that tech companies have been able to generate internally or generate from venture capitalists and so on. So they essentially had what felt sometimes like almost unlimited research budgets. Uh, and, and that may no longer uh, be the case if the, the sort of layoffs that we're seeing are, are perhaps an indication of, uh, of what's going on that front. So if those things are happening, would you expect that to change the patterns you're seeing? And, and if so, in what ways? Yeah, so Jax, there are ten plus things moving, moving parts here. You know, in, in this uh, indeed complex but important pattern that you have you have identified. Um, maybe let me let me start with uh, just just sharing a few thoughts on the uh, on the U.S. and maybe you can try to make a, a comparison. Um, so in so uh, so you uh, so. When we're talking about industrial policy, we're mostly talking about money, right? So you're giving money to firms, we're giving money to to universities. Um, and if we, we recall, our uh, data actually shows number one is in the non AI domain. Uh, if if you want to encourage novel innovation, 
this is not really happening on the firms. So you probably would want to support the universities that actually are, are, are doing this because they are indeed pushing the frontier. Um, and it's coincidentally, traditionally, not, not AI domain, um, firms, so there's some research showing that firms investment, not in R&D, but this is really just about basic science, declined over time. So it's not really playing that much of salient role in innovation anyways. But the reversal, the reversal in the AI domain was not caused by a lack of money or funding. It was lacked by, uh, it was caused by a lack of data. So part, so based on our research, we feel like part of the industrial policy, in addition to talk about money, um, we also need to talk about data, data ownership, sharing of such data. So far, firms that are actually really at the frontier of these AI technologies, they some of some of these technologies are made freely available to public for whatever reason. So that's another separate interesting question. But that could change. Right, so it's, it's a private property, and they may decide not to uh, to to give it. Um, so therefore, uh, in, the, in when we're thinking about industry policy in the U.S., particularly related to AI, we want to make this big. We want to make this push. And actually, Jacks were writing. We're trying to get this paper out here to say that it's not just the money. It's also about the data. So data, you've heard of data as a new oil. It determines who is winning, who is losing, and who what is being produced. So part of that should be some sort of societal agreement on privacy policies on data sharing. Um, and that part, as I see, is 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 kind of missing or is not part of the, is, is in a different conversation, is not in the conversation of uh, promoting um, uh, promoting a techno of technologies per se. Um, so, so in China, uh, you've heard it before looking, we're facing a lot of uh, opaqueness and uncertainties at this moment. Um, it, it, so uh, as, as you, Jack says, you, as you clearly identified, uh, the influence of the state, uh, which is understatement, <laughs> yeah, on firms uh, is increasing a lot. And then there's always this question about what's going to happen to the private sector that has been pretty pretty active in developing this and, and applying these AI technologies. And um, so, if you want to read the book of uh, Kai Fu Li, was about AI power, and that 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 describes how AI technologies have been developed in China, mostly in the applied domain, but moving very fast um, in the private sector. So. Uh, it's not just the for that 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 what what the state is giving giving money to firms or giving money to universities is will these firms exist will they be confined within the boundary when they exist and and whether that kind of boundary they were put in um allow enable them to develop AI technology as did before so with that comes a question of their quote unquote if the such thing happens that then their replacement which are the state-owned enterprises. What their role is, where, so, so we will be able to look at some of that in our data. Um, and what we've seen, at least in a non-AI paper that uh, that my, my co-author my co-authors and I published, uh, state-owned enterprises, they are they are good at producing patents. Uh, but there's a lot comes a lot of question to to say, you know, we, we need to identify the type of patents that we need. And where where the frontier is, um, they, and that and then these firms are highly sensitive to agency risks um, that they have in them. So uh, yeah, this is a very messy answer to your messy question. <laughs> That's only fair. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think it is it's fair also to, to underscore just how how difficult in some ways this space is becoming for what we think of as the highly successful Chinese tech firms. I mean, you know, the, the, the more hardware companies, you know, that's one thing, but but certainly a lot of the tech giants have been caught in the so-called regulatory yeah. storm of a little yeah. over a year ago that kind of clipped their wings a little bit, uh, made them a little more risk averse. They don't want to give uh, reasons for a regulatory crackdown on them. Uh, and uh, we've seen China develop really what is at least on paper, a remarkably protective law concerning personal data. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's targeted largely at what companies do with it, not what the yeah. state does with it. Uh, and so, so they're, they're operating in this increasingly difficult uh, environment, as, as you point out. Um, so I want to uh, ask a couple of related questions here, one of which draws uh, from one in the chat, which is another thing that's, that's kind of um, in the mix going forward uh, is uh, data localization, right? There's been mm -hmm. a lot of concern in the U.S. 
uh, that China is going for data localization, that, that raises a whole bunch of issues. But one of the ones one often hears is that this is essentially hoarding the new oil, right? Uh, that is, you've got a very large population and you've got this massive vacuuming up system of, of information yeah. that the, basically yeah. China is the Saudi Arabia of uh, digital information in they effect, are. and that that will give it obviously a huge advantages. Um, so, you know, do you see those those data localization or data data non export uh, policies as as affecting um, the relative advantages of the U.S. and China? Because although you're looking at what happens in each country and how they compare. Your research clearly ties into a story about U.S.-China competition in this space. Yeah. I mean, it clearly pays off in that area. So, go ahead. Yeah, your your audience has uh, tough questions and they're important questions as well. Um, so, indeed, our, our research and also other research out there in the in, in economics uh, shows that data is plays a sig significant role in how far you can push the technology frontier. So the more data you have, it is more likely you are able to identify the right questions to 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 add to ask and also develop these uh, uh the, the the needed algorithms to uh, to solve them. Um, so uh, uh, if you think about data as a, re a type of resources, um, yes, abundant resources increases the likelihood of for better technologies to be developed. Um, and um and, but then i feel like i i, I somehow feel like we're we're in this very difficult uh, uh domain to think about does that mean we should just relinquish our data and give it to a super entity and trust with it and for it to develop there will be a bunch of other questions uh, going down the road which is that you do have the resources and again it comes to firms as well you have the resources which are the necessary but may not may not be the sufficient condition for you to develop technologies from these resources to the technology frontier there has to be multiple things that are so in getting the incentives right getting coordination right that's that has to, so so many things needs to be right in order for the data to um to uh, uh to, for, to go from data to actual technology being developed so i, I, I just want to put a qualification here although indeed so far the evidence indeed shows that um uh, more data, more access to data increases your technological advantage. Um, but I'm not here to to quickly jump to a conclusion that they necessarily you you, you will definitely be uh, so there will be a bifurcating such that uh, whoever has the data would definitely will, will, will lead. Um, instead, this this middle part would be like from from this data, from the data to technology, there are a lot of human factors. And that's something that I and, and my co-author and I were trying to understand. What are the conditions that enable you to produce more? Because from there, there's in, in there, there's also the issue of a waste. Right? You have so much data, but then there's output. How, if you don't get incentives right, and again, same thing with money. A lot of these resources resources will be wasted in producing the output that you you, you desire, um, and then the question is how much waste uh, are we able to uh, are we willing to tolerate? Yeah, uh, that's an important set of points. Um, and uh, you know, you, you've just a, one minor footnote there about the possibility of treating this as kind of a common resource. Uh, alas, the history of international cooperation in that space is not very good. You know, we talked about the uh, deep seabed mining authority under the law of the sea for all the manganese nodules and other things that kind of didn't work out so well. Uh, we talk about the treating outer space as a common resource, even as we see it now yeah. recently carved up uh, for uh, for certain countries and companies. Uh, uses, but we'll not get not get into an Elon Musk discussion here. Uh, <laughs> so one one sort of almost flip side of, of what we've just been talking about that was also raised in a, a question in the chat is, um, as you pointed out in your last remarks, to get from data to meaningful AI, you need human capital. You need you know smart people and lucky smart people uh, to hit on the right things. Um, in the United States, we have a much remarked upon shortage of STEM graduates, of engineers and software engineers and, and, and various technology engineers. Um, and a lot of what we do have uh, comes from China and to a degree from India. Uh, but we also have this theme in American politics and immigration policy now and national security policy that worries very much about, you know, every Chinese a spy is, is the, mm -hmm. the critical take on that. Um, how do you see that? playing out? I mean, how dependent is the, do you, do you have data on how dependent the U.S. sector is on this, this kind of uh, uh, immigrant or temporary uh, located um, 
uh, talent, and given the importance you rightly attach to talent, what does it mean if we look at this as kind of a U.S.-China competition that you do have uh, people coming here bringing incredible skills and talent, but also sometimes going back? Yeah. Yeah. So, so here is is uh, uh, is really not like not AI specific or no innovation specific. There's the evidence to like is that immigration generates so many so much so much benefits for the, the for the receiving country. And what's interesting is that I've seen multiple academic papers that were using that were using shocks or political shocks to H one B system um, as a shock to supply of uh, human capital in the country, and there are a whole bunch of. Uh, uh, outcomes they are trying to examine, such as the rise of entrepreneurship, uh, changes to entre entrepreneurship, um, changes to different type of patenting behavior. Um, so, uh, so from that literature, what I've seen indeed is that restraining, let's say, restraining type of, uh, uh, in, in, in those cases, are H1B um, visa allocations. Restraining kind of immigration, obviously, it will, it will, will clearly constrain uh, the, the supply of talents. But what's interesting is also changes the structure where the, uh, uh, where the constraints that of those who manage to stay um, in that uh, in that they they may become a lot more risk averse because <laughs> you're tight you you, you you don't want to lose this status and and as a result of which you may not want to switch to a different field switch to a different employer so on and so forth um, uh, so. Uh, it, so I guess what I'm trying to, trying to say is that so, I, I, uh, um, so the things I so that the, the things I would share with those were my points. Uh, I have academic. I'm thinking about academic papers. So I'm if if there's something that I don't have evidence on, I'm going to say it's a speculation. I don't know whether that's true or not. Um, so in these cases, I've seen academic papers showing that um, there are common consequences that you've see, you've seen of uh, a limiting talents inflow. Uh, would produce and there are also some unexpected consequences of limit talent inflow will change the psychology of those who manage to get here or to stay making them more risk averse and less entrepreneurial um, in order to just at least for a period of time before they get their uh, uh, their more legal status uh, so to speak so in both cases it actually is um, if I may use the word Jax um, it's just distorts um, the system compared with what could have been achieved by using those human capital. Fair enough. Um, so I want to just take you back to one of the themes that, that's in your uh, read or one of the points that's in your research, which, which I would just like to get you to say a little bit more about to the extent your data can support it. Uh, which is the funny map, right? <laughs> that is these these places that one thinks of as not being terribly advanced uh, economic areas in China, right? We all think of the Gold Coast uh, and yeah. the firms are definitely concentrated there. But but for the universities, you get these sort of odd um, uh, blips with, uh, with a Shanxi, uh, Sichuan and Hubei, right? Yeah. Um, how, how do I mean, I, you, you sort of mentioned in passing, it's kind of a local politics story, but could you could you flesh that a little bit more? Because I mean, so here's the paradox uh, from some yeah. of this in a more general uh, China economic policy perspective. You know, one story is, of course, everything in China uh, winds up being um, a lot of localism, and especially in economic areas, local authorities have a fair amount of discretion about what to emphasize and what not. And that's a very common story about China during the reform era and how economic policy works. But then there's this other story which gets told about innovation policy, which tends to sound much more centrally directed, you know, pots of money going to the people who are going to pay off. So, so where does, does your research here and what you found, where does it point us in, in terms of understanding that uh, the parent paradox. Yeah. So um, indeed, those. This is a kind of an interesting, <laughs> interesting graph. Um, it, normally, we we'll expect a lot of things happening here. And these are the coastal places where there are active firms. There, there's a there's a need. In these places, the demand for technology apparently did not really come from firms. And obviously, you, you, the question is, is there a marketplace for AI such that these things can be sold? So that's a separate, uh, to, to the coastal area, that'd be a, a, a separate question. Um, so, um, so this is something that we are trying to understand, but I can give you anecdotes before we actually get systematic evidence. In a lot of these other, these other places, you also have their, I know there's a degree of decentralization in China. You have their local 
leading politicians, political leaders trying to establish their own careers and establish their track records. So this this particular uh, uh, um, anecdote was with Guizhou here, right? Is that right? Um, in, in, the, in the Guizhou province, they, they have a, I, I should have remembered the name because we have that in the China quarterly publication, um, a star uh, 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 politician who actually developed their large data, like large, big data centers and AI technologies. That's part of the legacy. Um, but then when that person was promoted and moves to somewhere else, um, these projects gets neglected. The reason is a very, it's not an economic reason, it's a political reason, because if you're a successor, you want to make your own name in a different way. You are not there to resume the legacy of your predecessor star politician. You want to create your own history or your own track records. So a lot of these um, these big AI uh, um, projects just get, get stalled. So therefore, when our, our, I'm going to say speculation, because we're, we're right now we're working on trying to produce some systematic evidence for it, is that in many of these places, um, heating or paying like, extra attention to these emerging technologies, those hot, trendy, sexy technologies that the central governments want is a way for their local politicians to actually stand out, for the regions to stand out. Um, and then that, that's also a way for the region to gain more political and economic status, if you if you will. Um, and will the, the output of such effort be used to put in that productive uh, in productive use. There might be, you know, because those are technologies. Uh, but at the same time, I suspect there will be some waste in that some of these AI pageants are just produced for the sake of producing it, um, um, and it's lying there. And um, obviously, here you can see the uh, you can see the, the the conversation. Oh, maybe those those the, in the process of training this technologies. Uh, we're 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 training more talents, and they may come up with new ideas. So these these technologies foster further further technology. I can you imagine critique, academic critique, uh, already in that, in that in that direction. That is definitely a possibility. Um, it's just right now we don't have systematic evidence on either side. And I am in uh, in the process of producing the systematic uh, evidence to show you to what extent these active AI patterns are are produced by political, sometimes political career incentives of the leaders in those regions. All right. So the, you know, again, interesting intersection then between the the two, the two stories and and. Uh... Yeah, as in so many areas, there's often a, an individual political leader uh, story that explains some of the variation. So one other sort of paradox in what you're talking about here is that historically, at least in the U.S. model, uh, basic research, a lot of it was done yeah. by universities. Uh, a lot of it with government money, of course, particularly Defense Department yeah. money. Yeah. And then, and then the applied sort of more fine-grained technology would often be done by firms. Yeah. Uh, you're finding that firms are actually playing a larger role um, and, you know, is that because the data intensivity and data ownership, they seem to suggest this, just makes us a different kind of basic research, uh, such that, that um, universities aren't, in a, don't have a comparative advantage in, in doing the innovative stuff? So, uh, so Jax, the, uh, also the pattern you described in, 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 uh, in our, in our literature, we have a pastor's quadrant to capture that. So indeed, some basic technologies needs or be used and also useful, they need to be funded by public funding and firms. They are using, they are, they are typically looking at, uh, uh, uh more applied and, but then useful patterns. Um, so, uh, by the way, uh, so a lot of these basic research are done, going back to the very first question we see from your audience, they were not captured by patents, but, but because patents by definition, they are more applied. So those basic research, they are, they are captured by publications, academic publications. That being said, we have publication data, we continue to see this reversal in publication as well. Firms are actually more active in producing AI publications in addition to AI patches in the US. Um, and uh, so, uh, so at this moment, uh, our explanation indeed pertains to the availability of data uh, where it resides, is it, the data are with the firms. So, uh, so yes, we see this pattern in patents, 
pageants and also in academic publications. Um, uh, and I think the implication um, is for public policy is number one is where do you want to throw your money at? But it's a lot more complicated if you want to throw public money at a private firm. <laughs> um, and an and, and integral to this the, to this consideration is something we've we'll spent some time discussing is what do you what do you want to do with the data in public policy? Um, what is the societal agreements of uh, where data should be held and where, how it, sh it can be shared? Uh, and of course, in, in all systems, that are very much in the, in the U.S., uh, it's sometimes hard to pick up what exactly counts as a public subsidy. I mean, they're throwing public money at things, but there are also regulatory breaks, tax breaks, and all those kinds of things. So it becomes uh, devilishly complicated. So um, my hat is off to you and your colleagues who try to figure out what the data that's going to give us uh, traction on, on the phenomenon we really want to get at. And, and I, I congratulate you on the work you've done on that front. Well, as inevitably happens with any discussion of tech policy involving the U.S., it, it ends up with the discussion of national security issues. So we've got yeah. a couple of questions uh, that have come in on that. Um, and you know, this has not been a focus of your data, but I'm sure you've, or your research, but I'm sure you've run into it in the course of the kind of, of, of people you've been talking to and then and, and sort of interview portions of this, which is, um, you know, to, to what extent do you see already or do you see uh, possible um, hints of a future where we see national security concerns really affecting the space you're talking about? That is restrictions being placed on collaboration or export uh, of, of AI type technology from China to the US or vice versa uh, because of this concern that it will, in the most direct uh, case, uh, have national defense, national security applications, military applications, yeah. or indirectly that it will affect national economic security, which in turn affects what the Chinese like to call comprehensive national strength, uh, which matters uh, for security issues. So in uh, two minutes or less, uh, feel yeah. free to have that one. Yeah, so, uh, uh, so Jax, uh, um, um, we have been asked that question before, especially in the map, like where are, are these Western provinces are places for military, uh, for military use? Uh, we need to identify them. So as I said, a tricky thing is AI technology is a general purpose technologies. So it can be the same thing can be used for purpose that used in very different domains. And we need to figure that out. But but to give you a little more satisfying answer, uh, if you're interested, um, and I'm, I'm going to re recommend uh, uh, a recent, I think, working paper by David Young from, from Harvard Economics. And they actually show that they have the data on the treaty, international treaties of applica AI applications. What they, what they see is a bifurcation, which is that um, a democratic countries selling to one, one another, um, autocracies are selling AI technologies to one another. So so it seems to be that their so their their explanation is more of a of policy or public policy or political uh, one, which is that because of these kind of a political reasons, in the technology trading becomes a two it becomes bifurcated in two centers. It seems to be two clusters um, that are divided based on uh, the, the the democracy versus the autocracy. Um, so I thought that was a pretty fascinating uh, uh, finding, and that also that is also uh, that is also something as related to industrial policies, because a lot of these treatings of, of AI technologies are in the form of applications. So I developed this entire system, and it, in particular, a lot of being technologies being exported from China are are a system that enable you to do mass surveillance. <laughs> So then all of a sudden your imagination runs, runs wild, you can see all sorts of implications um, uh, that there, there is about this. And I think that's a, a terrific point uh, to end on. The foundational technologies, you know, the, you know, sort of trunk technologies out of which the branches grow, uh, inevitably have the characteristics of dual use technology. Right? You, can't, you can't really control end use uh, in an effective way. So there's this urge uh, to control it. And as you pointed out at the close of your remarks, one of the clear applications of AI and AI-based technologies is the surveillance state. So there's kind of a values-based yeah. issue here. It's partly national security in terms of military applications, and it's partly the values of not wanting to support the export of autocracy or the tools of autocracy. Um, yeah. So you, know, you 
brought us around to one of the topics we often talk about here in these FPRI sessions. Uh, and you know, again, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for uh, sharing your work. And uh, you know, this, is, this session has been a, a great reminder of uh, it's a good thing to have facts and have rigorously analyzed data before one, one leaps to conclusions. So uh, thank you for doing that. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I hope you'll join us for future installments uh, in our activities on Zoom. And occasionally these days, we soon we'll be back to doing more in-person stuff. Uh, and again, uh, if you enjoyed today's program, please join us for future ones. And please consider joining FPRI or otherwise supporting us. Uh, last but far from least, uh, thank Thank you to Professor Nanjia for joining us today and uh, sharing her and her colleagues' work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jack. I appreciate it.